All right, top 10 sins and struggles, here we go. This is lesson number seven in this series. And we're counting down the top 10 sins and struggles according to a recent survey. I'm not going to go into all of that. We understand what I mean by the survey that we took. And here's what we learned so far about the results, what people said, their top 10 sins and struggles. Number 10 was laziness. Number nine, anger. Eight, kind of a tie there, cursing and gossiping, sins of the tongue. Number seven, pride. Number six, neglecting church. Number five, coping with change. That's the one we did last time. And tied at number five, coping with conflict. Those were tied. Uh, I didn't do them in the same lesson because they didn't naturally go together like uh, cursing and gossiping, you know, sins of the tongue. It was a little easier to talk about that within the same lesson. But coping with change and coping with conflict, really two different things, wanted to take an entire lesson to do that. Uh, another interesting thing is that tied at number five are two issues of struggle, not sin. Coping issues concerning change, coping issues concerning conflict. So there are all kinds of conflicts that occur between people, you know, at work, uh, within family, school, church, personal, financial, social issues. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, we don't have time to define every type of conflict, but we can examine the idea of conflict itself. And that's what we're going to do uh, tonight. Look at conflict itself and maybe some Bible concepts on how to deal with it, help us to deal with it. So the dictionary defines conflict as a struggle between opposing principles or opposing aims. Another definition, a clash of feelings or interests. Isn't it interesting that the number five sin or struggle we named in our survey was struggle itself? So the definition in the dictionary sheds light on the cause of most conflicts, whether it's conflicts between countries or conflicts between partners in, in marriage or two people working in the same office. It doesn't matter you know, which type of conflict it is, there are some things which are common to all of these conflicts and that's what we're going uh, to look at that. In its simplest form, we can say that conflict is caused by how we react or handle differences. How we react and handle differences. So the study of conflict and conflict resolution has to do with how we handle or react to differences. Now, of course, if we lived alone on islands, there might be a struggle to survive and in finding food and shelter, but there would be no conflict because everything would be done our way. <laughs> we're going to build a boat to get off the island? Well, we're going to build it my way. Why? Because I, nobody's going to be there to second guess me, right? But we don't live on islands and our way of thinking or doing things often bump up against other people in our homes, in our families, in our community, and the world at large, who do things their way. So you have our way and you have their way. Anytime you have our way and their way, conflict, conflict. So when our way and their way are similar in approach and objective, well, there's harmony. However, when their way and our way are very different or have different goals, the possibility for conflict arises. Of course, it's not just that their way and our way are different. There are other factors that contribute to conflict. Again, I'm talking in very general terms here, okay? but these ideas fit into the smallest of conflicts to the largest of conflicts. So here's some factors that contribute to conflicts. Perception. The problem between our way and their way is often one of perception. We just don't see things the same way and there could be a lot of reasons for that. We don't always perceive things the way that they really are. Maybe because they're different. And this happens because we many times don't take the time to listen 
or we don't make an effort to understand how many arguments, when people finally sit down and try to talk things through, how many arguments or conflicts end up with this type of dialogue? Oh, you, you mean you were not talking about my brother, you were talking about your brother, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I assumed you were talking about my brother and I was feeling all insulted and you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> sometimes we're just not paying attention and we, you know, we make up what we think has happened and we run with that. Sometimes we've just been given the wrong information, so our opinion becomes prejudiced. I mean, you know, in those, uh, in those uh, schools in Palestine, the Middle East, where you have these teachers teaching children from a young age that America and the West and so on and so forth, you know, these are evil people, they're out to kill you, they're out to take advantage of you, they're out to destroy you, you know. When you're taught that from an early age, you get to be 19 years old, of course you'll strap a bomb to yourself. No one's ever taught you any different. You have this perception, ingrained, incorrect perception, but it doesn't matter as far as you're concerned, it's the, it's the thing you're going with. So we react negatively to their way because our perception is that their way is not good or weak or not true or dangerous or against our way somehow, or perhaps their way is just not going to achieve the goal. And in the end, if our perception of their way is negative, for whatever reason, we will enter into a conflict to replace their way with our way. And pretty soon you forget their way and our way, and the only thing you got left is the conflict. In other words, the conflict takes up so much oxygen that you're just dealing with the conflict. You've forgotten what the original thing was all about. Did you ever, did you ever get into one of those situations? I haven't talked to my sister-in-law in years. Why? Well, I don't know why, we just don't talk. <laughs> Another factor that con contributes to conflict, pride. We think our way, in whatever context, is always the best way. <laughs> right? So as long as everyone else goes along with our way, there is no conflict. Now there are a lot of reasons for this type of attitude, but the most common one is a false estimate of our true worth. Some people suffer from you know, low self-esteem, and they falsely think that they're, like, they're not worthy. And then there are others who suffer from an overly high esteem of themselves and they think that they are more worthy and many times this leads to conflict. It's not usually people with low self-esteem that initiate conflicts, it's usually people with too high a, a self-esteem. They're the ones that cause the problems. So you know, perhaps we have pride over culture leads to war and mass murder. Our culture is significantly superior to yours, so we can destroy you and get rid of you. Or pride for our way uh, destroys couples in marriage, or partners in business, or friends at church, or brethren. So when we assume that our way is best, we will always be in conflict. It will be a constant experience in our lives, because we always know the best way. You ever, you ever say to someone about someone else, you can't tell them anything? You know people like that? You just can't tell them anything, why? Because they know everything. Their way is the best way. The bread they buy is the best bread. You could have studied the Bible for 40 years and gone to all the Bible classes and so on and so forth and this guy never darkened the door of a church, but he will tell you what the Bible is all about. Why? Because you know, whatever comes out of his or her mouth, it's the best thing. So one other factor here that I want to list, the main one, so we have uh, perception, pride, and then the third one, politics. Now when I say politics, you know, I mean, you know what, remember what we're talking about, the things that lead to conflict. 
right? Perception, pride, politics. When I talk about politics, I don't just mean government, you know, liberals versus conservatives or Democrats versus Republicans versus libertarians versus whatever. Yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I mean the games that people play in order to get their way. That's what I mean by politics. You know, governments, you know, they play politics so that they can hold on to power in order to exercise their way in running the country. And are we not immersed in that? Presidential, you know, we're just in the primaries, but man, it's 24 seven. I'm referring here to strategies and methods that groups or individuals use in order to impose their will. And I'm saying that the methods, the politics that people use to get their way, this is the cause of conflict many times. So some politics you know, are brutal, like in many countries where the government uses force to impose their will on the people. What did Mao Zedong say? The best diplomacy comes at the end of a gun? <laughs> sure, we'll talk, but I'm going to have the gun. So you know whose way is going to get done in the end, right? Some politics are subtle, like a young child manipulating one parent against the other in order to get a new toy. That's politics. They learn it at a very young age. And so politics, you know, when I say politics, I mean the way that we get our way. Politics also has an effect on the intensity of conflict that we will experience in our lives. For example, um, uh, those brutal regimes that use you know, just naked, raw force to get their way, well, often these things give rise to resistance movements that push back against that kind of thing. And what do you get? Civil war as one group pushes back against another group. Well, that's conflict. That's bloody conflict, to the death kind of conflict, but it's conflict. Or a domineering boss who insists on her way or the highway. That person may foster employees who become passive aggressive in their behavior in order to block her plans just out of spite. That's conflict quiet conflict, but conflict nevertheless. Or the husband who thinks his opinion on everything is correct may create a wife who challenges him on everything just to prove him wrong. Conflict. And so the list goes on and on in the various ways conflict can arise based on how we impose our way over their way. So our politics, are formed by our ethics. In other words, our sense of what is right and wrong. This is the wellspring of our politics. And so how we impose our way will be guided by what we believe is right and wrong. This is true for governments, as well as married couples, or people at work, or family, or friends. How we choose to get our way will play a large factor in how much conflict we experience. Why is it that we have relative civil peace in our nation? Well, because the government gets its way, but in a democratic fashion. We get to vote. Yes, I know there's all kinds of failings and weaknesses in that, but we still get to vote. You know, we may not like who the president is. Well, you know, four years, we get a chance to get that person out of there. That's why there isn't you know, shooting and killing in the streets here, because the way that the government gets its way is through a democratic process. Not so in places like Russia or the Middle East. Right There, there there's a lot of civil war. Why? Well, because Bashar, for example, the president of uh, Syria, how does he get his way? He drops barrel bombs <laughs> full of nails and, and ball bearings into neighborhoods where children and, and people, civilians live, and beats them down. That's how he gets his way. Well, what is the result of that? Well, there's any number of groups that are pushing back, trying to overthrow him. And 200,000 people have been literally murdered. Why? 
Well, because of the way that that guy decides that he's going to impose his will, his government will on the people. That's the difference, politics. Okay, so let's talk about the Bible and conflict. Now that we've kind of gotten a couple of general ideas. I'm of course acknowledging that the subject of conflict, very, very wide, very complicated, and you know, trying to cover it in a half hour Bible study, you know, just not possible. But we can make some general observations to the causes of conflict. So let me just summarize what I've said. Causes of conflict, perception, the perception that my way is better, pride, the understanding that, well, my way is the best way. Politics, that's my way by any means. In the same way, I think we can make some suggestions from the Bible as to how we can avoid or at least lower the frequency and intensity of the conflict in our lives. How do we do that? Number one, examine my way. Examine it, put it under the test. Be honest about yourself. What does Paul say in Romans 12, 3? For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Let's face it, the reason for most of the conflicts in our lives is that we're not able to get our way somehow. Not all conflict, but many times you know, we just want to get our way and we're not getting it. What does James say in chapter 4, verse 13? He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Obtain what? My way. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So when we don't get our way in our personal relationships, our jobs, our family, whatever, we begin to examine the person who is blocking our way or the situation blocking our way instead of looking at ourselves. Conflicts, you know, rarely resolved without a change of some kind, but they persist because we always expect the change to come from somebody else. <laughs> if that other person would just change, everything would be smooth around here. <laughs> we want them to change their way in order to accommodate our way. Why? Well, I go back to the thing, because well, doesn't everybody know our way is right, it's better, more comfortable, it's, or maybe it's just our way. So God tells us through Paul to be honest in how you evaluate yourself and also how you evaluate your politics, how you, you know, get your way. What does he say basically? He says, don't measure yourself by yourself, but rather by the faith that God has given you. you know, he says in the other passage, the measure of faith given to each one. You need to understand in the Bible, when the Bible says uh, faith, it, it means one of two things. It means either trust, like I have faith in God. That means I trust God, I believe in God. And then there's another way that faith is used when there's an article, when it says the faith. When it says the faith, it's talking about the doctrine, the, the Christian religion, the things you've been taught, the faith. Well, in Romans, he uses the measure of faith. He's talking about what we know, the understanding of our faith. So the faith here is the body of teaching provided by God in His words. So here's how we put this idea together. In other words, Paul is saying Christians don't have their way. What they have is God's way of dealing with things dictated by His word. And so what's the way I'm looking for? Not my way. I'm looking for the way that God you know, takes care of this particular matter. So Paul is saying, measure your way against His way to be sure that these two are compatible. Here's my way and here's, well let's start the other way. Here's God's way 
and here's my way. Well, are these compatible? Well, oh, yeah, okay. A person's estimate of himself is too high if he insists that his own way is better than God's way. And this attitude you know, smacks of pride and always leads to conflict. Usually conflict is avoided or greatly reduced when we seek to follow God's way in our dealings with other people. So there are examples of God's way replacing our way when in conflict situations um, include, but certainly are not limited to. In other words, let me give you some scriptural ways that you know, we measure our way with God's way. So let's look at Proverbs you know, 15.1. What does he say? He says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. All right? This is something our children learned from their mother. Lee's con constantly quoted this to them. Always. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers. You're saying, well, how would that work in a, in a family setting? Brothers and sisters fighting over the TV, over whatever, and saying, well, you're stupid. Yeah, well, you're dumb. Well, your way is no good. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, this is a better show, and you had your turn, and rah, 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 you know? And mom's answer was, hey, a gentle answer deflects anger. Uh, Julia, you're not going to convince Paul to let you watch your show or whatever if you yell and scream and call him stupid and selfish. That's not going to work, girl. And so a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. That's God's way. Instead of, we fight fire with fire. You see what I'm saying? Here's my method of you know, handling stuff. I fight fire with fire. That's my way. God's way is a gentle answer reflects anger, deflects anger, but harsh words make time. You see what, I'm, see what I'm saying? Let's do another one, all right? Romans 12, 10. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. That's God's way. Instead of my way or the highway. <laughs> That's how I handle you know, conflict at the office or with other people. It's my way or it's the highway. You don't like it? You don't have to be here. That's my way. But God's way is love each other with genuine affection and take delight, listen, in doing what? In honoring one another. And so we need to always be aware of what we are contributing to the conflict that we are experiencing. In other words, we need to ask ourselves, if we're in conflict, the first question is, am I, am I handling this God's way? Is my way and God's way you know, what I've been doing here match? And then we need to ask ourselves, what have I contributed to this conflict? Is it my pride? Am I incorrect? Am I prejudice? Is it my approach? What, is, what am I doing to pour gasoline on the fire? Have you never had that experience? Something happens and then it starts here. It starts here and that thing that you're about to say and your brain is saying, don't say it. No, 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 no. Too late. Too late. Am I dealing with their way using God's way or my way? And how much of this conflict am I responsible for? An honest, meaning a judgment based on God's word, an honest estimate of ourselves or our way is often the beginning of the end of the conflict. A little self-examination. That's why when I do counseling sometimes with the especially a married couple, I like to see each individual alone first. They say, well, we need to come in and talk to you, blah, blah, blah. Oh, fine, you come in first. We decide who wants to come in first, because I want a private conversation with that person so they can just get it off their chest and not be interrupted by the other person as they vent, as we examine their way of handling stuff. 
and then I see the other person without talking about what happened, they get to, you know, and then I get to see them together, but here's the thing, I've taken notes and the problem is you can't double back on what you said, you can't change it because you've already told me what you're doing. Okay, uh, second thing, the Bible, right? So number one, how, does my way match God's way? Number two, expect conflict. Some people are the exact opposite. You know these people that can't stand any confrontation? They run away all the time. Any little confrontation, they, any little potential conflict, their way of handling that is. So what, 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 what do they have in their life? Nothing but potential conflicts. You know, it's like walking around broken glass all the time. So we need to expect conflict. There will always be conflict, always. As Christians, we need to minimize what we do to create and intensify or prolong conflict, of course, but we also need to be realistic and realize that we just can't eliminate conflict. I mean, we're sinners. We've not been, we've not been called by God you know, to stop all the conflict in the world. This isn't the purpose of Christianity. I know a lot of people think that is, but it's not. Jesus said that there would always be conflict of some kind in the world, Matthew 24. He said, in Je well, Jesus said, He answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and will mislead many, and you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See to it that you're not frightened of those things, uh, for those things must take place, but that is not yet the end, for nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there'll be famines and earthquakes, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. In other words, this stuff is going on all the time. Are we surprised that there's a typhoon somewhere in the Philippines and 10,000 people are dead? That's a terrible thing, but are we surprised? No. That there are wars? No. That you got into an argument with your husband? No. Absolutely not. Why be surprised? Jesus even warned His disciples that because of their faith in Him, they would be drawn into conflict. Matthew 10 says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be the members of his own family, or his own household, rather. So the only conflict we engage in is the one that involves disbelief and the belief in Jesus Christ. There, in other words, there will always be conflict, so you know, don't lose any sleep over that. But the conflict that we ought to enter into is the one uh, for the sake of faith in Christ. This conflict, this struggle, will always be present within ourselves as we strive to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. It was an easy thing. I said, there's, here's God's way and here's my way. Compare them. Well, you know, that, that, that's an easy thing to do, you know, a little visual that I've just given you, but that is a very difficult thing because usually here's God's way and here's my way. And for me to go, That's very, very painful and very difficult and it takes a long time. And I get into conflicts many, many times before I start, you know, I start getting how to do this right. And we will constantly be challenged to stand up for our faith in the presence of a disbelieving world. So there's always conflict of some kind, but Christians focus on the one conflict involved in establishing the spiritual kingdom of God within ourselves and in the world and try to minimize the other types of conflict. Obviously conflict in the world is largely due to sin of some kind and in the world there's a great effort to resolve or win conflicts using a variety of man-made approaches, you know, force, war, social activism, diplomacy, mediation, hypnosis, drugs, whatever. As Christians, you know, we don't deny that these conflicts happen and will continue to exist and that there are methods or resolutions that these things, you know, they work, mediation, wars, whatever, they work to a certain extent. 
However, we also believe that the ultimate solution to conflict, whether it be between two countries or a mother and her daughter, is peace through faith and submission to Jesus Christ by both parties. You want to end the trouble in the Middle East? <laughs> the Jews and the Palestinians become converted to Christ and submit to Him. No more war. It's the end of the war. I know we're going like that'll ever happen. But you know what? That'll never happen if we don't go there and preach the gospel to them. You know, never happen without at least making an effort. I've often said we'd have less trouble in the Middle East if we were a little more successful in, in going there and bringing the gospel instead of going there and trying to extract their oil. That's just, yeah, that's how that works. So this idea may be foolish to the world, you know, preach Christ, bring peace through Christ, that may sound foolish to the world, but it always succeeds when it's attempted. So we accept that there will always be conflicts, but we choose which conflict to struggle in and how we will fight. And how do we fight? Well, here's how we fight. We fight with the, the sword of the Spirit. What does Paul say in Ephesians 6? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle, there it is, struggle, conflict, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is, our, this is, our, yeah, this is how we struggle. This is, these are the tools we use in our struggle. This is God's way to win the struggle. And so uh, from a biblical perspective, how do we deal with all the conflicts in our lives? Well, one, examine our way. Does it compare with God's way? Two, expect conflict, but involve yourself in the spiritual conflict using these tools and try to minimize the other types of conflicts. Number three, engage in prayer. Engage in prayer. I know that going to God in prayer you know, is a pretty standard answer for all of life's issues. I mean, you know, <laughs> if you had to fill in the blank, you know, if you had a, a religion test you know, about uh, Christian, uh, the lifestyle and you just close your eyes and put prayer in, about, in all of the things, you'd probably get half of them right. You know, it's a pretty standard thing. But if there's ever a time for fervent prayer, it's when we are in conflict. And it's usually the time we least want to pray. Because when we're in conflict, we want to act. <laughs> we want to take care of business. We want to get revenge. We want closure. We want, to, we want to sit there and review in our minds, well, the next time they say that, well, I know what I'm going to say, this is what I'm going to say, boy, that'll shut them up once and for all, and blah, 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 and boy, it sure wasn't fair, you know, here I was, everything I'd done for that person, blah, 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 blah. and now, boy, they treated me this way, you know. We'd rather do that. Wait a minute, I'm going to go make myself a cup of coffee and I'll be back in a minute, you know, so I get a little caffeine so I can really stay into it for a while. <laughs> instead, of, instead of saying, and I say this in respect now, oh my God, not the OMG uh, you know, on Facebook, I mean, oh my God, I'm being drawn into a conflict here. And when there's a conflict, you know who's there, right? <laughs> yeah, the evil one is there. It's not Jesus that draws you into a conflict to curse and hate your, your neighbor. That's not Jesus that drew you into that. That's the evil one that drew you into that. We need to say, oh my, 
How did, I, how did I get into this? Like walking into quicksand, how did I get in here? And fall on our face in prayer and say, Lord, please help me to get out. Usually the conflict, I don't know about you, but is pretty painful or threatening, or it creates all kinds of upheaval and change in our lives. You can't sleep, you can't think straight, you lose your sense of humor, certainly your sense of joy, your ability to focus on things, because it's always the insult or the conflict or the problem, it's always there. Many times conflict is, is simply a diversion by Satan to prepare us for a fall of some kind. I'm going to repeat that. This is very important. Many times conflict is simply a diversion by Satan to prepare us for a fall of some kind. For example, Cain was in conflict with Abel over the appropriateness of his sacrifice. And his anger and resentment ultimately led him to kill his brother. Paul and Barnabas were in conflict over Mark's conduct during their first missionary journey and their conflict could have threatened the future of Paul's important mission work. So when we are in conflict, we are vulnerable, so we must take extra care and time to lay our case and our thoughts and our frustrations and our pain before God in prayer and seek God's way forward, His solution, His insight to guide us. Because many times it's just not just about the conflict. The conflict is the thing that hooks you in and makes you vulnerable. There's a second shot usually coming. Many times when we're in conflict, we'll pray about things but will neglect to do the second and more difficult part of the prayer. And that is wait for an answer and wait for God to act. The psalmist says, be still and know that I'm God. The hardest thing to do is wait. Wait for God. <laughs> it's so hard to do. The word tells us that God will direct us. He will teach us. He is going to show us the way. Psalm 25, show me the right path, O Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. If this wasn't true, it wouldn't be there. If He didn't do that, He wouldn't give us instructions to wait. Wait. So when we're in conflict, too often we try to resolve it ourselves without waiting for God to guide our actions or to act on our behalf. Remember, the thing we want to do when we're in conflict, we want to act. And sometimes, you know, I don't mean badly or meanly, we just want this thing to be over with. I'm just going to go down there and I'm just going to tell, give that person a good piece of my mind, so long as it's clear they know where I'm at. You know. <laughs> So whether it's a conflict with a friend or a conflict inwardly or a conflict in living the right way as a Christian or conflicts with our spouse, engage the Lord in prayer and wait for His leading out of the conflict. You know, God knows the root and solution to all conflicts in our lives. Prayer helps us not only see what God sees, it also helps us to do what is necessary to reduce the conflict and to have peace. Not the peace that the world offers with truces and treaties, but the peace that can only come through Jesus Christ. And I repeat, one of the objectives when we're in conflict, one of the objectives of prayer, one of the things we're asking God in prayer is, Lord, please let me see this thing the way you see it. Open my eyes. So we're in conflict with God and each other. Why? Well, because of sin. And of course, Jesus makes peace with God on our behalf through His death on the cross. That's the gospel, isn't it? It's an easy step from talking about conflict to talking about the gospel. 
Each of us, of course, can have peace with God through forgiveness of our sins. And I'm you know, preaching to the choir here, but when we believe in Christ and we repent, are baptized, one of the greatest conflicts in our lives is over. Our conflict with God because of our sins. So once, you know, once we have this blessed peace with God, then we have the Spirit's power within us to be at peace with all men as well. And so the first thing you know, when we're in a conflict, make sure that we're right with God first, then ask to see the thing the way He sees it, His way, and then move in the way that He leads us as we patiently wait for His instruction. Okay, so some thoughts about conflict, some ideas about some resolution according to the Bible. We will move on with number four in our series next time. Thank you for your attention.